Hello, welcome back to Jim Hutzpah's Neighborhood. This week we're going to continue the discussion on bearings and thermal growth. we also talk some about pillow block bearings. Uh, also, on another note, if you haven't got your pump training in yet, make sure to get that done. Anyway, I'm going to give it over to Jim now. Hi, I'm Jim Hutzpeth. Today I'm going to have some assistance from L.J. Johnson. We're going to be discussing some pillow block bearings and further discussion on ball bearing from roller bearing conversions. L.J., come on in. So, L.J., basically what I've got is two pillow block bearings. And what I'm trying to simulate here is if we had an electric motor, these would be the bearings within the electric motor. This is a shaft basically for this. So what I'd like to do is take the tops off of these real quick. So we can just remove the top of the pillow block to see what the insides of the units look like. Long-winded. Okay. So right now, what we've got is two bearings that are pillow block bearings that are basically the same bearing setup, except for this is what's called the fixing ring. So this is what limits the float of the bearing depending on which end you want to lock if you're assembling a set of pillow blocks on a shaft or running a fan on this end, an electric motor on this end. This is really important because if you take this out of the package real quick, I'll take the shaft out and what we'll do is we'll we'll set up and put it in this chamber yep just set her in there now do do me a favor put this you have it good that's uh, this would be the locking ring on this particular one so let's put it to this direction and if you'll notice we can move this bearing now almost the exact width of this fixing ring. So if we install the fixing ring in the unit, like so, that took out all the play in this bearing. So right now, if we were to lock the bearing onto the shaft, this being the shaft, we secure the bearing with the race on the inner race. This would now be the clamped end. So at this point, our shaft being clamped over here would grow in this direction. Now keep in mind the pillow block on this end does not have the fixing ring. So that bearing can move a good three eighths of an inch or better, the width of this, to allow the growth. So when our thermal growth between bearings could be, let's just say 30 thousandths, we won't preload this bearing. This is our locking bearing. This would be our coupling for our motor. We don't want our thermal growth to go towards the motor and mess up the alignment, okay? So locking this with the motor coupling on this end, this allows the fan or whatever we're gonna drive to move to take up the thermal growth and what it is, is our bearing's fixed on the shaft journal. It's tightened here, so the whole shaft's gonna move with the bearing, and we have over three-eighths of an inch or better, whatever the width of this spacer is, that it can grow. So that pretty much is exactly what's going on inside an electric motor that we're changing from a roller bearing to two ball bearings. We now have a ball bearing on this end of the motor, we fixed it so that it's clamped in the housing with the spacer. We've tightened it to the shaft and we want the other end of that to have room in it to grow. So calculating the thermal growth is what's gonna give us the amount that we need to machine out of the housing or the bearing caps, whichever it may be, to allow it to expand on the one end and not try to bend the shaft in the middle or preload the bearings to where the bearings are extremely worn out real quick. So using the pillow blocks is a, just a good demonstration to show that when we're doing this, we have the same effect. Now you guys that are going out into the field, 
are installing pillow block bearings a lot. If you got two of these clamped rings going on, you're going to have bearing failure at some point because you've got no place for expansion. So when we go out to balance a fan, and it's a big fan, and they say they've changed the pillow blocks, I would be concerned myself just to say, what's in there? You know, what, can you show me what you took out and the arrangement real quick? Because it's only going to expand if it has these two locking rings in it and clamped to shafts on both ends. It may not, it may not be a week from now, but in, in two months or a month or whatever it takes, if this is hot enough, it's going to expand until it gets out and takes out both of the bearings, all right? Then you could have a major catastrophe with the, with the fan itself banging around inside of the unit. So the idea of what the formulas that we've been given out in our last class is to calculate the distance between the two bearings and then do the calculations to know what that thermal growth is and that's the amount that we're going to want to take out of the housing along with the cap having 20 thousandths off of the cap on that end. That's just to make sure there's not a clamp on the bearing by any chance from the bearing cap. We want it to have enough depth in the housing to go for the hottest. So on average, running motors here in our shop, you're going to see bearing temps anywhere from 90 degrees, 80 degrees on the low end roughly to having to having a problem with a shaft running in the field that might be 150 to 175 degrees. So if we pick the higher number to do the calculation, we're guaranteed to have enough room in the housing for it to grow without it becoming a problem and preloading later on when it's being used in a, an oven application or some type of a deal where the shaft is getting extremely hot from the process. It could be a hot hot air fan and over time the shaft slowly warming up coming towards the bearing arrangement and creating it to grow at a greater length than it did originally. The axial length is the same calculation whether it's a one inch diameter or whether it's a 10 inch diameter. So once again the formula is is pretty much the distance between in inches. So we'll be taking this dimension if, and if we called this just 20 inches, that's 20, times the temperature you think the shaft's gonna be at, and it's safer to go longer than it is shorter in this case. So if we're gonna calculate anything, I'm gonna say, if it was me, I would at least do 150 degrees. It's probably gonna be safe in most cases, but you could go 180 for your formula and write it down. So you've got 20 inches times 150 times Five, actually point five zeros six seven. That'll give us the total shaft growth for that number, and then that's what we're going to machine out of our housing so that this thing could grow that much. We don't want it to be on our test pad and actually have the motor working just fine. Our temperature in the shop today is probably 65, somewhere in that neighborhood. We run it, we don't see any issues whatsoever customer gets it and puts it into real application and all of a sudden his hot component is warming up our shaft and this is now growing at a further rate and that's where we get into trouble. We think that we've got a motor that's ran for almost an hour long on the pad, our bearings are stabilized, we don't see any problems. Customer gets it and at this point now we start to have a problem with bearing failure. And this, if we lock both ends of this, I want you to keep in mind the shaft's still gonna grow, and at this point, it could grow either way. You've clamped it both, and it has no place to go except for to bend in the middle, or preload both bearings until one of them decides it's got enough room to take up the thermal growth. We both know that a, a ball bearing is typically gonna have about one to two thousandths internal clearance to move around. So if the shaft goes 20 or 30 thousandths in length, you're gonna pretty much smoke the bearing in short order, is what I'm gonna say. We've had experiences here where we've run bearings and when they have a problem, they don't last very long at all, okay? So I think it's detrimental that using the pillow blocks is a good uh, practice just to get the idea that we've clamped it on our shaft, we've clamped it in our pillow block with our fixing ring, and over here, we've installed our bearing without it. We would install our bearing with 
knowing which direction it grows closest to the shoulder, but we'd leave some room. So if we have this much three eighths, let's just say, we would probably leave three, five sixteenths of an inch going the direction that it needs to expand. So when we're looking at these pillow block bearings, they call them non-expansion and expansion. So a non-expansion bearing would be this. We have it so it's clamped on our shaft. We have it with our fixing ring on the inside so that bearing cannot move. This is a non-expansion end. This one with our bearing in the middle would also be whatever, uh, say an eighth of an inch on both ends. That's only a quarter of an inch and this is probably three eighths. So you would divide that and put it in the middle if you had some special issue going on. But I would have it myself closer with maybe hundred thousandths and let the shaft grow in the direction where it has the most room for the whole bearing to move with the shaft in that direction. So being careful in the field because you go to do a fan balance and the people say, well, we just replaced the bearings. You balance the fan and two weeks later, they're calling us up saying that the fan bearings went out again and we need to come back out and do something. Well, the first thing is you didn't install them. You don't know what's in them. And my feeling is, is that it'd be helpful to the customer if we're able to quickly take our tops off and just inspect what they've got. Or start asking questions. And ask a lot of questions so that we know, did they go the right direction for the clamping bearing? Did they have two fixing rings? Anything along that direction, okay? Um, I try to relate this to the motor theory because it's open where you can actually see what's going on. With us in a in a electric motor, we're going to be having a bearing cap that's gonna clamp this bearing. We're gonna put a lock nut or a snap ring that's gonna clamp it to the shaft. And our housing would be in the bottom of the housing or another bearing cap squeezing it. So we've clamped it just like this. So this just gives you a better idea of what clamping is by being able to tighten this ring down to our shaft and having this ring in it to keep it from actually moving. Then this end, thoroughly end up just allowing it to grow and be happy with going the direction of the growth. So remember again, it's best if you can, you can't always do this in some applications, but it's best if this is the coupling to have the growth go the opposite direction of the coupling so you're not doing a hot alignment later and finding out that there's a problem and it's because of the thermal growth. The thermal growth is a big one. So the longer the distance between the bearings, the greater the thermal growth. So that's the number you're gonna multiply. So our, our 20 inches times 150 times 0. .000067 is one value, but if we made it 40 inches, it'd be twice as much. Is what I'm trying to say. So that's one, that's one big issue, making sure that you've got these dimensions and you want to go between the two bearings for that dimension. If we know for sure the temperature of the shaft that they are running, it'd be good to plug that in, but also asking questions about, is this motor ever going hotter than this? Are we always seeming to run at this temperature? To have a better idea. If you have any doubt, give it some more room to grow. You don't need a half inch by any means. I'm just saying that if there's a doubt, add 10 thousandths or something along that line to the added number. One of the rules of thumb that's fairly accurate is 10 thousandths per foot per standard shafting material, meaning coal roll, meaning 4140, 4150, standard shafting material. It's 15 thousandths per foot if you're running with stainless steel. So stainless steel will give you a, great, a, a longer growth, okay? So important for you guys to know when you're in the field because a lot of the shafting that's out in the field will be pump shafting stainless. and stainless.
Yep. Whether it's non-magnetic or magnetic doesn't mean anything at that point. So keeping the two values in your head, it's easier to remember 10 thousandths per foot per standard, 15 thousandths per foot. Or you can use the equation, which is five zeros point, five zeros six seven, or five zeros nine six for stainless, if you want to plug in all the values and do it the right way. But those are really, really good numbers at 10 and 15. So a 20 inch shaft, pretty much 20 thousandths until you start plugging in hotter values. So it's a good, it's a good practice to get into. But hopefully, does it make sense to you on a motor with clamping the opposite drive end, let's say in this case, and having it grow towards the shaft extension, you should be able to calculate the distance between the bearings. And imagine some of these rotors you'll see come into the shop that are purple. <laughs> well, how, how hot yeah. do you think the shaft was? <laughs> so at this point, I'm just saying that 150 is probably a conservative number. You know, even though we're at 65 degrees when we're in here running right now. But I'm saying that we want to be cautious and give it enough room so that when the guy calls you up and says, I've only been running it two days and now we've decided that we're going to run full time and it's 100 degrees outside and the shaft's running 100 degrees more, it's 200 degrees because the calculation could really change in the, the amount of growth that's going to bottom out in the housing and cause the shaft to bend or cause the worse yet the balls to look like they're squeezing into the rollers or the races inner and outer. Preload. Preloading the hell out of it, okay? So I hope this is something that you guys will pick up on. I think it's a, it's a little better to describe it this way so you get a better idea of physically seeing that you're moving your shaft, watching it grow, and having your bearing move with that shaft so you're giving it room in the housing that you're calling the non-clamped end or non-expansion end or expansion in either one, depending on which way you go. This is non-expansion. This right now would be the expansion. There's nothing clamping the bearing other than the inner race. It will grow with the shaft and it's allowed to move within that pillow block housing or the motor housing, okay? All right, well, I hope this has helped you guys. It's, it's a short presentation, but I think that it's important. Uh, I know it's confusing to a lot of people to, I've got a motor, I've got to change it, and. What do I machine off and do I do it right? Hopefully this is a good way of describing it so that you can get it in your mind what we're trying to do. It is best to do the drive end and let it grow to the opposite end if you can. If you're stuck with that position, then you need to, at, at least if you're the people that are installing it, work with the coupling knowing that you want it to grow without any obstruction between the faces of the two couplings. So. Let's say that you have um, a geared type coupling that has the teeth on it. You'd be able to take out a gap disc if that was the case. And now that shaft could grow without ever interfering. And, it, you know, you could have up to a half an inch maybe between the two couplings. If it's a problem with the other end or if it's a problem with your motor being a sleeve bearing and it cannot move, well, now you've got a problem because you're going to have to deal with distance on the shaft where the coupling's placed or changing of a coupling design to get that free floating okay all right well that's all i've got i hope this has helped everybody if you have any comments or you need any help doing this i'd be happy to to walk through it again with anybody uh, i hope la you're you're listening to this so you got a better idea it should be easier for a machinist to look at this and see what he needs to do and that's kind of the main thing here our last class was a little bit a lot of math and stuff, but I think this is describing it where you might understand it better. That's all. Thank you very much.